Hi, it's Dom here, pastor at Assemble Church, and this is our podcast. We hope you find what you're looking for today and that you are challenged, inspired, and equipped to live out the life that God has for you. Enjoy the message today. So then, uh, John, the Gospel of John. So firstly, a brief introduction. The Gospel of John is a gospel. Uh, The gospel, the word gospel, it means good news. And uh, there are four gospels in the Bible. And what they do is they record and they tell the story, the ministry of Jesus' life over three years uh, between uh, between sort of uh, the start of his public ministry and his crucifixion uh, and subsequent uh, death, uh, burial and resurrection afterwards. That's what the gospels do. There are four of them, and they all have slightly different leanings, slightly different uh, audiences, uh, and slightly different ways of telling the story. The Gospel of Matthew is, uh, is, um, is written to a Jewish audience, and the purpose of the Gospel of Matthew is uh, to show that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who we've been waiting for. That's the purpose of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, the Gospel of Mark, uh, the purpose of the Gospel of, uh, of Mark is to show that Jesus is is uh, is the servant. He came to serve. He came uh, not to uh, not to sort of uh, be a high and mighty uh, king, uh, although, although he is that as well. Uh, but the Gospel of Mark comes to, uh, shows that Jesus came to serve. Uh, we, that's why you know Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Etc. Uh, and then the Gospel of Luke. Then uh, the Gospel of Luke is uh, is to show that Jesus uh, is the perfect man. He's the perfect man. He is the one that is worthy to atone for our sins. And sixty percent of the gos- of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke are similar, similar content, told in a similar way. Uh, they're similar books. However. of the Gospel of John is unique. 90% of the Gospel of John is unique. And uh, the, the, uh, the purpose of the Gospel of John is to show that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. John... The author of the Gospel of John, he was a disciple of Jesus, John the Beloved, and uh, and he was the last remaining eyewitness to uh, uh, to the ministry of Jesus. He was the last remaining disciple uh, who witnessed everything, uh, sort of close close up. All the other disciples uh, by uh, by the end of John's life, they'd all sort of died before him. Uh, John is the last remaining eyewitness. He's described as the disciple that Jesus loved, uh, and he is, uh, he is the, the one that Jesus told to, uh, to look after his mother. Uh, when Jesus was on the cross, he was, he was being crucified right at the, uh, at the very end uh, of, uh, of, of Jesus' uh, earthly sort of life. Um, uh, jo- uh, Jesus looked down from the cross, and uh, his brothers were there as well. His brothers were, were around as well, and his, and his mother. And he said, no, John. Would you look after my mother? And, uh, and so John was Jesus' best friend. John was Jesus' best friend. He was there in the close group of three uh, with Jesus the whole time. John uh, was Jesus' best friend. And it's most likely that the Gospel of John was written last uh, and that the, the purpose of, of John, uh, what he was trying to do was to fill in the gaps. He was trying to fill in the gaps uh, and make it so that there, there could be no question. There could be no uh, question uh, about, uh, about the, the identity of Jesus. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a great quote about the Gospel of John uh, that, uh, that's from uh, St. Augustine. And he says this, John's Gospel is deep enough for an elephant to swim in, but shallow enough for a child not to drown. What does that mean? It means uh, that if you're here this morning and you are a, a, a Christian uh, who has been studying the Bible for, uh, for 80 years, there, is still, there are still things in the Gospel of John for you. It's still, uh, that there's still so much to discover because there's so much in the Gospel of John. Uh, but if you're here this morning and you've never heard the name of Jesus before, uh, then the Gospel of John will not overwhelm you. Uh, that is the Gospel of John. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, as, uh, as we said, uh, the Gospel of John uh, is really here to help us answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? See, John is convinced about who Jesus is. There's no doubt in John's mind about who Jesus is. And the aim of, uh, of this book really is to show the reader, is to show us uh, who Jesus is. Because this question, who is Jesus? 
And how you answer this question is the single most important thing about you. Did you know that? How you answer the question, who is Jesus, is the most single factor, important factor in your life. Uh, It defines how you see the world. It defines how you see other people. It defines how you treat other people. It defines how you you respond uh, to situations. It defines how you live your life. And it defines what happens after this life. The question and your answer to uh, uh, who is Jesus is the most single uh, important factor about you. And everyone will answer this question. Everyone will answer this question. And everyone uh, will, uh, will be sort of judged accordingly. And the purpose of John's gospel is to give the reader all of the relevant information. It's to give the reader all the relevant information so that the reader can make an informed decision. And that's, that's why we're studying the gospel of John, uh, so that we can make an informed decision, so that we can analyze uh, what is going on here. Uh, because it's the most important question anyone will ever answer. Yeah? So good. So good. Now, starting in John 1 then, there are three distinct sections uh, to John 1. The first is uh, John speaks in verse 1 to 18 about the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus. Uh, The second section in John 19 to 34, uh, John talks about uh, identity in Jesus. Our identity in Jesus. And then the third section uh, in uh, verses 35 to 51 talks, uh, John uh, uh, talks about uh, purpose through Jesus, our purpose then through Jesus. And so we're starting off with, uh, with the person of Jesus. That's section one, so I thought it makes sense to do that one first. <laughs> Joke. So lighten up. <laughs> it's a bit decaf in here this morning, isn't it? Wow. So we're starting off then, the person of Jesus. There are eight Eight different things that we learn about the person of Jesus in the first 18 verses of John. And I'd like to show you them if that's okay. You might have uh, seen these. You might have noticed these uh, as, uh, as you were reading uh, the, uh, the chapter in your own time this week. Uh, but I'm going to go through them anyway. Uh, so the first then, we're starting off in John 1 and verses 1 and 2. We read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And so the first, the very first thing uh, that we notice, in fact, about this is that John's straight in. He's straight in, isn't he? There's no introductions. Oh, my name's John. I've been, you know, a disciple for a while, and I, I'm writing about this. No, no, no. John is straight in uh, to, uh, to what he's saying. Uh, he's, uh, he's going straight in, uh, and he's echoing the first line in Genesis. Did you notice that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Uh, he's echoing the the very first line in Genesis, and it's not an accident, and it's not just a a clever little quote, Uh, it's on purpose, because the audience knows uh, what happened in Genesis. They know the scriptures well, uh, the the Jewish people at the time, they know the scriptures, they know Genesis, they know in the beginning, and they know everything uh, that comes with that, and we spoke a little bit about this last week, didn't we? Uh, We talked about God being uh, being in the beginning, God being uh, present uh, before uh, there was anything to be present in. And, uh, and so they know Genesis 1. And so John is bringing to mind Genesis 1 and everything that we associate with Genesis 1. He's bringing that to our mind immediately. And, uh, and what he's saying is, hey, you may have missed something in Genesis 1 because it wasn't explicitly written. Jesus was there as well. Jesus was there as well. And, uh, and he later goes on uh, to say uh, that, because uh, uh, he's, he's speaking about about the word. He's, he doesn't use the name Jesus yet, does he? He says the word. Yeah? See that? The word. Uh, in the beginning was the word. And uh, the Greek for that is logos. If you want to write that down. I don't know. Might help you in some way. <laughs> Fun to know, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and later he's going to go on to say who this uh, word is. But really what he's saying is everything that we know about God in Genesis 1, we apply that same uh, thing to Jesus. Uh, So so we're we're immediately answering this question, well, who is is Jesus? And John is saying Jesus is God. 
Jesus is God. There's no doubt in John's mind. Now, this question, uh, this question uh, is, is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? Is this man God? Uh, it was asked at the time uh, in, in the first century when Jesus was walking the planet. Uh, people ask, is this man God? Is, is he God? He doesn't, I don't know. It's weird, a man to be, uh, to be God. Is, is he God? And so it's not a new question on the lips of people in 2022, uh, but it's still asked today, isn't it? Is Jesus God? It's still asked today, and you ask different people the identity of Jesus and, and, and who he is, you'll get different responses based on who you ask. Uh, if you ask a Muslim who, God, who Jesus is, they will tell you he is a prophet uh, from God, but he, uh, he is not God. If you ask a Mormon who uh, Jesus is, they will tell you that he is a man who was created, who became God. Uh, so, so not a uh, true God. Uh, if you ask a Buddhist who Jesus is, they will tell you that he is a man uh, who reached a significant level of spiritual enlightenment. But he is not God. And if you ask a Jew who Jesus is, uh, you'll get some different responses. Uh, some will tell you that he is a prophet. Others will tell you that he is uh, a fraud, uh, as, they, as they believed in, uh, in, uh, when Jesus was, uh, was walking the planet. But John is very clear on this. He knows how he's answering this question. Jesus is God. Is that okay? You might say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. Several times, many times throughout Scripture, uh, throughout the, the ministry of Jesus, uh, several times uh, 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 likening uh, and referencing uh, Scripture uh, and, and such claiming to be God. He never actually used the words, I am God. If you look for those, you won't find them. That is true. But he claimed many times through scriptural reference and, uh, and, and other significant ways, miracles he performed, and what have you, that he is God. It's why he was crucified. <laughs> It's why he was taken to the cross. So Jesus, yes, he did uh, claim to be God. That's why they killed him. And, uh, and it's all throughout the New Testament. Jesus is God. He was present in the beginning with God. He predates creation because he is God. And John has no problem with saying that Jesus is God. This is the first two verses. Now, John knows the ramifications for making this claim. Uh, because he is around in a Jewish culture in the first century where, uh, where what he's saying, the claim that he's making, is a dangerous claim to make. It's a dangerous claim to make, and it's a claim that has had many of his friends killed and persecuted and arrested uh, because what he's doing is blasphemy, is blasphemy. And blasphemy is when we take the Lord's name in vain uh, and, uh, and, 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 or, or when we claim, uh, claim a thing is God and it's, and it's not God. Uh, and, and this is blasphemy. Blasphemy these days in, the, in our culture, not an issue. Not an issue. Uh, it, it is an issue. It's a very serious, serious issue for us. Uh, you know, for, uh, and we know that because the Bible uh, tells us that. But in the culture that John lived in, blasphemy was a very serious issue in the culture, uh, that, could, uh, that could get him into some hot water. If you claim that Jesus is God today, what are the ramifications? In this country, anyway, uh, you might be made fun of. Some people might say you're nuts uh, to non-believers, the people that the Holy Spirit hasn't yet convicted and shown uh, Jesus. But in John's day, where John lives, things were much different. And yet, he still makes the claim, Jesus is is God. Is that okay? That's the first point. All right. Of the first section. <laughs> okay, let's move on then. Verse 3. Uh, we read this. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And so our second point, our second identity of Jesus is that Jesus is our creator God. There are two categories in this world. That which is created and that which is the creator. Uh, we all fit into the created category. Everything that we see around us fits into the created category. But Jesus was present at creation. We know that from verse 1 and 2. Um, and, uh, and so we know uh, that, uh, that Jesus predates creation. Now John's audience already knew uh, that everything was created by God. They already knew that as I said because they already had the scriptures. They already knew Genesis. Uh, however uh, what, is, what is new a new revelation from John is that it is Jesus. It is through Jesus that all things were made. 
And this idea of creation is, uh, is, is, is really important because because it, it, it speaks into uh, it speaks into the fabric of the world, doesn't it? And how we see the world. See, some people will tell you uh, that you're an accident that came from nothing in an explosion type thing that was completely accidental, and you have no purpose apart from anything that you make up yourself, and you're going nowhere. And it sounds really sad <laughs> when you think about it. Uh, but that's not what John is saying here. John is saying, no, uh, there is a creator. If there's a creator, there's a creation, and you're it. Uh, you came from him. Your purpose is in him and you will return to him. So it speaks into us and who we are. Uh, and Jesus, along, uh, along with the Father, uh, along with the Holy Spirit, is creator. Jesus is not created. He's creator. There is a creation and you're part of it. And that's a happy, a happy story because the alternative is pretty sad. Anyway, that was a quicker one, wasn't it? firing through now. Uh, Right, let's move on uh, to uh, verses four to nine. Here we go. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light uh, shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is not the same John as is the author of this gospel. This is John the Baptist that we're talking about now, uh, whose name was Uh, John, Uh, he came as a witness to testify concerning the light uh, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So the next thing that we learn of Jesus is that he is the illuminating God. He is the one, uh, he is the one that brings light. The world contains darkness, doesn't it? Yeah, the world contains darkness. This isn't a Christian worldview. This is an objective, observable uh, thing that that anyone uh, who knows Jesus or not can look out the window and see that the world uh, has darkness within it. Uh, There is a, uh, it's it's kind of like a, what's the word? Analogy for evil. Is that the right word? Analogy. We'll say that. We'll use the word analogy. It's an analogy for evil. It's very clear, very easy to see evil in the world, regardless of whether or not you know Jesus. Uh, That part isn't controversial. That's not a controversial claim to make. There is controversy in this preach, by the way. Oh, yes. We'll get there. Um, Yeah, that part's not controversial uh, at all. But where the Christian message disagrees uh, with the prevailing sort of thought of the world uh, is this. Uh, Where does the light come from? Where does the light come from? If there's darkness, which we know there is, there has to be the opposite, which is light. Where does light come from? Where does light come from? And the, the prevailing sort of, I guess, uh, myth in society and, and, uh, and, and, w- and what we might sort of be told is that there is light in you. There is light in you and that your light will bring light into the darkness. And, and it, it, it sounds great, um, but the Bible actually says the exact opposite. It says the exact opposite. It says that there is darkness in you. It says that there is bad in you. There is sin in you. That's what it says. Doesn't sound very cheery, does it? No. It offers an explanation as to the origin of that darkness. Uh, Sin. Sin. Uh, The first transgression in Genesis gave way to to all others. Uh, And that sin has its roots in pride. It has its roots in pride. It has its roots in a thought that is, what about me? It's all about me, my way, my truth, what's good for me. There's a, uh, there's a rapper. I like, I like rap music. I also like uh, Christian music, and so I really love Christian rap music. And uh, there's a rapper called Lecrae. I think he's great. And, uh, and he's got a, a, little, a little line of a song, and it says this, uh, all sin has I in the middle of it. Huh? Which I like, because sin's a three-letter word. Yeah, and the middle letter's I. So uh, from, a, from an English language perspective, it's accurate. And also from a theological perspective as well. So that's good, isn't it? You can write that one down, I think. <clears throat> so by nature, uh, by nature, there cannot be light in that which is inherently dark, can there? That just doesn't make any sense. And so where does this light come from? And John claims here, John says, Jesus. Jesus brings light into the world. He is the light, in fact, of the world. Light illuminates the way, doesn't it? We need light, yeah? When you go driving in the dark, you turn on your lights. Uh, Sometimes, when you remember. Um, Mine do it automatically, because I always forget. (laughs) 
Um, when, uh, when there's a power cut, you reach for the torch because you need light, don't you? We need light. And so there is a recognition in general that light is needed, but often a rejection of the source of that light. The light in me ideology, the, the kind of the, the, the prevailing kind of thought in the world is interesting. Uh, I was thinking about it this week because, uh, because it actually leads right back to a, a, a prideful mentality, doesn't it? That it's all about me, that the light is, is in me, that, that I'm the source of, of the light. But then there becomes disagreements about whose light is best, doesn't there? Whose light is brightest? Who has the best uh, temperature, color temperature of light? Who, uh, who's, who's correct? Uh, ultimately, it leads to more darkness. It leads to more darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. John is not afraid uh, of making this claim. And it leads us quite nicely on to the next verse. It leads us nicely on to the next verse in, uh, in chapter 10. Verse 10, sorry. Uh, We read this. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And so our next point, our next uh, next identity uh, of Jesus is that Jesus is our polarizing God. He is our polarizing God. The original word I used was dividing, uh, but I did think that sounded a little bit harsh uh, to speak and to write down on a slide, and so I changed it to polarizing, which somehow seems a bit less harsh. Uh, But Jesus is our polarizing God. Here's the thing. The gospel message is divisive. The gospel message is hugely divisive. In the first century, it was divisive. It's not new now. Uh, and It's still divisive now. It's offensive The gospel is offensive because the gospel message is this. You are a sinner. I am a sinner in need of salvation. And that doesn't sit well uh, with those whose hearts the Holy Spirit has not convicted, does it? Because we don't like to be told that we're bad. We don't like to be told, uh, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that that there's bad and darkness in there. That's not a nice, cheery message. You couldn't put that on a TED Talk. That's not nice. You say, well, I'm not a sinner. Thank you very much. A lot of people will reject the gospel. John knew that. Jesus knew that, in fact. In Luke 12, uh, 51, he says this, Do you think that I've come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. What's this? This isn't a cheery message this morning, is it? No, but it's true. It's true. Jesus knew that, uh, that his message would divide people. People will disagree on the claims that he was making. That's, uh, that's, 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 what, he, that's what he knew. The, the gospel message is, is not about unifying people with people. It's about unifying people with God. I'm going to let that one rest because, because when, that, when, when God spoke that to me this week, I was like, Wow. The gospel is not about unifying people with people. It's about unifying people with God. And some folks just don't want to be unified with God. And that's fine. That's fine. Jesus said, Matthew 10, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, uh, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. It takes humility to acknowledge that I am a sinner in need of saving. And I am not the savior. And so it's divisive. It is divisive. Is that okay? Bit heavy? Am I losing the crowd a bit? Yeah? <laughs> Great. Let's, uh, let's move on then. It gets worse. It doesn't get worse. I shouldn't say that. That's a bad word. We'll edit that out of the podcast. Uh, but it does get a bit more controversial. <sighs> I love this. I really do. <laughs> uh, right. Next, uh, n- next up then, uh, 12 to 13. Yet to all those who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor of husband's will, but born of God. And so we find our next identity in Christ, uh, that Jesus is our saviour God. The story of the Bible is this. God is chasing after humanity to see full restoration between creator and creation. That's what he's aiming to do. That's what he wants to do. Humanity 
screwed up through sin. Uh, most of us, uh, most of us uh, know this. Uh, we screwed up through sin, through turning our back on, uh, on God which brought about a separation uh, between God and us. And so a solution is required to bridge that gap. Yeah? A solution is required to bridge that gap. And John says that that solution is Jesus. That solution is Jesus. The payment that is required for the sin that we have committed, uh, not only the, the sin that we have committed, but also uh, just the, 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 the sin uh, that, that, that is the human condition, That payment is the blood of Jesus. But the amazing thing is, is that the mechanism by which Jesus uh, is our saviour is acceptance and belief in his name. It's that simple. It is that simple. There's no ritual. There's no master class. There's no minimum entry requirements. There's no intelligence quota. There's none of that at all. It's it's nothing of that. Uh, It's just the simplicity of acceptance of who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. Jesus is our saviour God. Great. Let's move on. Uh, Chapter, verse, uh, verse 14. This one's good. I love this one. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one uh, I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. The next thing we, we learned that we know about Jesus is that Jesus is our human God. Jesus became flesh. Uh, the word is incarnate. Uh, 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 God incarnate. Uh, carnate means f- flesh. I mean, when you eat chili con carne, Right? You're eating chili flesh. Sorry about that. But it, it is what it is. Uh, that's, that's the origin of that word. Uh, so uh, uh, Jesus is uh, God uh, made human. God in flesh. Just as fleshy as I am. Uh, and, uh, and you are. <laughs> God needed to become human. That was a requirement. He needed to become human uh, in order in order to take on the weight of humanity's sin. He needed to be human to represent humanity uh, on the cross. Uh, so he, he absolutely needed uh, to be human. But in doing so, he experienced humanity. He experienced humanity. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was sad. He was angry. He experienced loss. He experienced physical poverty. He experienced persecution. He experienced death. Any, any experience that we have, uh, he, he experienced those too because he was human. He became flesh. God became flesh. In the Old Testament, Uh, God dwelt amongst his people. He was there uh, amongst his people the whole time. They built a tent called the tabernacle and uh, and God uh, God dwelt in the tent. And that was the presence of God right at the center of the community. And, uh, And only a few special priests could go into the inner part of the tent where the presence of God was sort of held uh, uh, just, just once a year. Um, but, uh, but, but this is, this is the presence of God existing in a tent, uh, in the center of his people. And, uh, and when God became flesh in, uh, in, 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 in the New Testament, uh, with Jesus, um, what is happening here is that God is once again, uh, coming to be, uh, at the center of his people. He's coming to be uh, in and amongst his people at the center of the community. Just as it was in the Old Testament uh, when he dwelt in the tabernacle. In fact, uh, the, the, the word here uh, for uh, he made his dwelling among us. The Greek uh, for dwe- made his dwelling among us is the, is the same word uh, in the Greek, in the Septuagint translation of the Bible, for tabernacle. The, uh, the, the phrase, uh, the verse here is literally saying Jesus tabernacled with his people. Jesus tabernacled. He was at the center. He is, uh, he is in the middle. He is amongst his people. He came to be with his creation. Jesus is our human God. Great. Two more. Two more. Uh, In verse 16 uh, and 17 then. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace 
in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now we already know that sin separates us from God, don't we? It creates this barrier because a holy God uh, can only accept a holy people. And a holy God can never lower his requirement to accept less than a holy people. And so, in the Old Testament, the law of Moses was given. The law of Moses was given and God said, hey, you've sinned, I, I get that, but, but here's, here's something. If you keep these laws and you do as I say, uh, then there is redemption for you there. There is redemption uh, for your sin in the keeping of these laws. There are 613 individual laws in, uh, in the book of Moses, in, in the law of Moses sorry it's not just the ten commandments oh no oh no it's not uh, 613 and the law immediately is kind of sounds harsh 613 rules man that's a lot of rules that just seems like over the top level rulage uh, in this place uh, and it sounds scary and it sounds like a lot but we need to understand this we need to understand that the law itself was grace it doesn't sound like grace it sounds harsh but it's grace because humanity had already sinned We'd already created the separation. And so grace, which is a merited favor or undeserved, uh, undeserved favor, uh, was given when God gave the law. He didn't have to give the law. It was graceful of, of him to, uh, to, to give a way to his creation uh, to redeem themselves. The law is grace. But it became clear that it didn't work, that we couldn't hold up our end of, of, the, of the bargain. We couldn't keep the law. And you might say, well, why would God provide a law if he would know, surely, in his infinite wisdom, that we would not be able to keep it? Why would he do that? It seems like a massive waste of time. Well, that's because the purpose of the law is not necessarily, and first and foremost, certainly, for us to redeem ourselves. It actually shows us that we can't. It shows us that we are incapable of doing that. We are not sinless enough to even to follow the law. The law shows us that we are incapable and therefore someone else is needed to keep the law on our behalf. And so the law points to Jesus. The law points uh, to Jesus, a further grace on top of the grace already given. The law itself should have been grace enough if we could just keep and follow 613 laws. That should have been enough, but it wasn't. And so there was grace applied on top of grace. Wow. Grace on top of grace already given. And so he is the one that redeems us. He is our redeemer when we cannot redeem ourselves. And so Jesus is our redeemer God. Next then, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in close relationship with the Father, has made him known. There is only one God. There is only one God. You might say, well, other religions have other gods. I told you there was controversy. The Christian viewpoint is this, those are false gods. Those are false gods. Those are gods that are created. Are they real? Absolutely. But they are created. This is a, a very complex and an incredibly uh, controversial issue, but it's one that we need to speak about, isn't it? I believe so. Anyway, what's the point in studying the Bible if we edit out the bits that, are, that might make us feel uncomfortable? <clears throat> False gods exist to detract worship away from the one true God. They didn't create the world. They didn't create you. They weren't even uh, there at the point of creation. They didn't speak everything into existence because there is only one true God who has the ability to do all those things. And they exist, these false gods, they exist as a distraction and they do a pretty great job. They do a really great job. Uh, these days, the world is less and less, I guess, spiritually aware. And so false gods don't only appear in the form of sort of actual religious gods, uh, but also uh, rather more contemporary distractions from God. Or, or more contemporary uh, distractions uh, from worshipping the one true God. The worship of self is a false god. The worship of celebrities is a false god. The worship even of the planet is a false god. 
The worship of that which is created is a false god. Anything that distracts us from giving our full worship to the one true God is a false god. Call it an idol, call it a false god, call it a, a demon. I think demons are those cute little red things with a pointy tail and a pitchfork. Nope, nope. Demons are things that we find attractive and seek to be placed above God in our lives. The whole strategy of the enemy and his army of demons and false gods is to detract worship away from the one true God. Because he doesn't want you to go to heaven. He doesn't want God to receive the worship that is due to him. It's a matter of pride, as we spoke about earlier. The Bible is a hugely controversial book. It's massively controversial. It was controversial then uh, when, it was, when it was written, and it's controversial now because it denounces the single most popular ideology in the world today. Do you know what that is? I'll tell you. It's relativism. Relativism. The idea that everyone is right in their own way. The idea that no one can be wrong, that there is no such thing as objective right and wrong, that there is no such thing as objective truth and lies, because that would be intolerant, is a, is a popular word today. Uh, that would be intolerant because everyone lives by their own personal truths and everyone's worldview is correct. And it sounds great until my truth says your truth is a lie. In which case, is it still true? I don't know. The what's true for me can't be true for me, but not true for you. That is just a logical impossibility. The Bible is not compatible with relativism. It's not compatible with relativism, and it's why uh, it's hugely controversial. The Bible speaks of light and dark, and angels and demons, and, and light and death. The Bible speaks objectively. And these things that are written in this book aren't just for a select few. They're for everyone. The Bible is either right or it's wrong. But it cannot possibly, it is, an, it is an impossibility for it to be right for some people and not others. If I say Jesus is the Son of God, the response cannot be, that's your opinion. That's true for you. It just doesn't make any sense. That just, that just doesn't make any sense at all. It, it's either true or it isn't. It's either true or it isn't. If Jesus is the Son of God, if Jesus is God, then he's God. He can't be God for just a few. He can't be the Son of God for just a few. It's all or nothing. And that's why we have a mission to tell as many people as we can. You know, some folks say your religion is fine, but you keep it to yourself because that's true for you. But if Christianity is true, then it's true for everyone. And I have a responsibility to tell everyone because it's not just my truth. Because it, here's the thing, if it's not true for you, then it isn't true for me either. It, it can't there's no such thing as relativism. And it is literally a matter of life and death. Back to uh, that chap that I, uh, that I referenced before, Lecrae. Another great quote from Lecrae. He's not a theologian, really. He's a rapper. But he says this, If Christianity is false, then I have wasted my life. But if Christianity is true then you have wasted your eternity. The culture that we live in is at war with this book. It doesn't like it. It doesn't like what it says. It doesn't like what it speaks. It doesn't like what it claims. It doesn't like this book because it brings an absolute and objective construct to a society that rejects object, objective absolutism. And that's why we're doing this, uh, that's why we're doing this series on the Gospel of John, because if we are to claim to believe this book, and we claim to, to be a church that is Bible believers, then we need to know what it says. And you know what, church, we need to journey through the bits together that might be tricky, 
that might be difficult, that might become sticking points, that might not be popular if you go shouting them around the pub. We still need to talk about them. We still need to know what it says. Because this book is written to us by God. And it is, a, frankly, a privilege to read it. I'm, uh, I'm already really enjoying our series on John. I've had a time ago, and this whole time we're on 40 minutes. There's no way we're doing sections two and three. We're going to have to roll over to next week. And that's going to play havoc with the preaching rotor. But it's okay. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. It's not important. Should we stand? Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you that you have written to us. That you have given us what we need to, uh, to, to live in this, in this world, to, uh, to, to, to make the most of this life that we have, uh, to, to, uh, to, to lift up your name high, uh, to, to align ourselves and point ourselves with the one true God. We thank you, Lord, that we have instructions and that we have, uh, we have um, the, uh, the ability to, through your word to discern uh, what is right and what is wrong, to discern uh, in an objective uh, reality what is objectively true, what is objectively right, what is objective good and what is objectively uh, against you. We thank you, Lord, for your guidance through this word. You know, I just want to uh, uh, want to want to give an opportunity this morning um, because we do this every week uh, to give an opportunity for anyone in this room uh, to um, to give their life to Jesus for the first time. We call it giving our life to Jesus, and it's nothing. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, it sounds a bit odd, I guess. Uh, but, uh, but what this is, is when we acknowledge, we make an acceptance in our heart that we say, hey, yeah, actually, I do believe that. I do accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. I do. Uh, I, I do. I don't know all the answers. I have so many questions. I can't even fit them all in my head. But I want to go on a journey to answering them. And so if that's you this morning and you're saying yes, Yes, I want Jesus in my life. I want to start on this journey of discovery. I want to start on this journey of excitement. If that's you this morning, then I'd like it if you can raise your hand. The Bible says that there is a party in heaven. It's a paraphrase. There's a party in heaven uh, when, uh, when one, one person gives their life to Jesus. And so, Lord, I thank you for salvation. I thank you that, uh, that there is a party in heaven each time one of your family comes home, each time one of your children returns to the Father. We thank you, Lord, for salvation. That there is a mechanism by which we can be at one with you again, where, whereby we, we can be in communion and relationship with you. We thank you, Lord. Amen. That's all for now. We pray that you heard something that brought life to you today so that you may go and be the person that God called you to be. God bless you.